Hey recap lovers, welcome back. Today's movie will be a 2014 South Korean drama film titled Ode to My Father. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. The movie begins in present-day South Korea. An elderly couple talks about childhood memories on the roof deck of their apartment complex. Unfortunately, the wife soon falls ill as her husband, Deok Su, brings her a bowl of porridge. Just then, all their children show up at their place to check their situation, with one of the sons chastising his father about prescribing pills instead of taking his mom to the doctor. They quickly depart for a family outing but leave all the grandchildren with the couple to look after. Later in the day, a group of men shows up to sign over the rights of the older man's store to them. He angrily protests, saying that his death will only be the reason for them to take his property. Finally, one of the men explains that it will be taken by the government whether he likes it or not. Hearing this, he sends them packing even though they promise to come back tomorrow. He later gets mad with a store owner parking his car along the pathway. In the eyes of the passersby, he is a stubborn old man. Hearing her grandfather getting angry at almost everyone, his granddaughter, Seo Yun, disapproves of his behavior since it scares her. To make up for her, they go for a walk, where she wittingly asks if he acted that way as a child. While walking, a passerby bumps into them, with him almost losing his grip on her on the street. Memories of the past flash in his mind, and he quickly grabs her and tells her a long story. It is December 23, 1950, in the middle of the Korean War. The family of Yun Deok-su evacuates as thousands of Hongnam refugees in what would become North Korea are to be transported south by the U.S. Navy. They walk in the middle of a snowy winter as planes from all sides scramble towards the battle lines. The refugees rush toward the Navy boats as Chinese military forces enter their town. The general of the 7th Division pulls back all his units and orders them to move out in one hour. Many families struggle as they beg the military police to let them aboard, only for all the boats to shut their doors. Then, just as hope is lost, the general orders to unload all cargo and ammunition to fit the large crowd of refugees in a boat. Seeing so many people in front of them, Deoksu's mother begins to doubt their chance of getting rescued. Still, her husband quickly gets his family to make a run toward one of the boats. As Deoksu follows closely behind, his sister, Maxun, accidentally trips, and he calls for help. Deoksu's father carries Maxun as the family gets closer to the shoreline. Reaching the boats proves perilous as many refugees cannot swim, or they either get trampled by others in the water. In a last-ditch attempt to get rescued, some men in the boat pull the Yoon family inside. Then, with all the boats filled to the brim with refugees, they head out to the general's naval vessel and bring everyone on board using the ropes. However, because of the ice, many fall off before reaching the ship, Meredith Victory's deck. As the Aksu's parents make it, he and his scared little sister struggle to climb upward. Unfortunately, someone grabs Maxun from behind, strong enough for her to detach from the Aksu's backside, as the boy gets on the deck without her. His father returns to search for her, much to his sheer disappointment. Just before going, he tells his son, in case he does not come back, to take the lead as head of the household and to go to the port city of Busan, where he'll find them. He then looks for Maxun, but to no avail, as the ship leaves the port. The family is crushed to see him left behind as the Chinese forces bomb the province. By 11 am, 14,000 refugees were saved by the Meredith victory. Early in 1951, Deoksu and his family make it to Gukch Market, Busan, where his aunt runs an imported goods shop. Unfortunately, her husband is a drunkard, so she constantly berates him for consuming liquor in the middle of the day. Just as she argues with him, the family arrives hungry and tired, so she serves them some porridge while they talk about Deoksu's father. At night, the family bunkers down in a tiny space in the basement. He enrolls in a local school soon after, where a classmate mocks him and his younger sister for being communists. Now a breadwinner from an early age two years later, he must do all sorts of odd jobs to support the family, one of them is shining shoes for well-dressed men. One of the customers, Mr. Ju Young Chung, notices a sign that explains he is from a northern province like him, so he makes small talk, asking what he'll be when he is older. Naturally, the boy desires to be a naval captain, which the man delights in hearing as he wants to build ships someday. Before departing, he gives him some advice, saying there are trials but never failures. The man waves goodbye from a green pickup truck made by his company, Hyundai, which would soon be one of the largest car manufacturers in South Korea. 
Deoxun and his friend Dalgu get approached by two American soldiers who give them a Hershey's chocolate bar, much to the dismay of the bullies right across the street. They chase the boys while causing damage to many of the town folk's property as they escape. As he reaches home, his mother and other residents grow worried over the radio broadcast about the Korean Armistice Agreement, which will halt all activities made by the armed forces in Korea until a final peaceful settlement is achieved. One of the women warns that even if there is a ceasefire, the war will still go on. While his mom is confused over this, Deoksu asks if he can return to Hongnam, only to be told that the provinces are being divided due to political turmoil. Afterward, the bullies catch up with him and his friend, beating them up in the street. Later at night, Deoksu asks his mother if he hates her for leaving behind Maxun. She replies that it's not his fault, and as a mother, she must fulfill her duties in taking care of them without his father, with Deoksu being the head of their family. Back in the present, Dalgu meets with Deoksu to heal the wrist of his granddaughter with an ointment. He presses his friend to sell the store as he did with his own and enjoy the earnings that the government will give. Across from their bench, a young Indian couple drinking coffee is being heckled by a group of high school students who look down on them for being immigrants. The Indian man berates them for their insensitivity, insisting anyone can be a citizen of Busan. Just before he brawls with a Korean student, Deoksu steps in to scold the teenagers. This reminds Dalgu of spending his young days with Deoksu, who back then was considered a beggar from a North Korean province. Sometime in 1963, he works at the dock in charge of transporting wood to help his aging mother with their finances. Dalgu appears to offer him a job in Germany as a coal miner to pay for his brother's tuition at Seoul National University. They continue their discussion at the movie theater, where Dalgu works as an operator. He contemplates over drinks since this opportunity will force him to leave his family. Meanwhile, his brother Ji Ju expresses interest in working in the mines to let Deoksu study, but his mother declines. Finally, a drunk and disorderly Deoksu comes home and grabs another drink in front of a portrait of his father. The following morning, he and Dalgu try out for the mining job inside the recruitment office. While shirtless, he and other fellow applicants demonstrate their strength by lifting heavy sacks of rice for a specific time. Though Dalgu fails in his attempt, Deoksu passes the first test as he manages to raise the bag over his head. Later, they meet with a recruiter who reviews their records. Though he is initially concerned about the two men's lack of experience in mining, he gets them through after being inspired to passionately sing along to the Korean national anthem, Igukka. Sometime after that, they finally arrive in the German coal factory and start their first day as Gasterbeiter, German for guest workers. Everyone is brought under the mines via elevator, and they navigate the dark to shovel coal on conveyor belts. During their work, an incident occurs where one of the workers gets hit by a piece of coal flying off the grinder. On another occasion, Deoksu gets hit by coal while drilling despite using a hard hat. To replenish their energy, the men eat their small ration of sweet potatoes while realizing the dangers of being miners. At night in the bunk room, the space is filled with miserable Koreans, with Deoksu crying, thinking about his life back in Korea. Out on a bicycle one afternoon, Deoksu meets a fellow migrant worker, Nurse Youngja, after crashing on a vegetable stall. He expresses gratitude to her for bandaging his bruise while slowly feeling enamored by her beauty. After getting acquainted, he describes her to his co-workers, saying she works at St. Anna's Hospital in Duisburg. The men are thrilled for him as he takes her out on a date dancing at a soiree. Every one of the partygoers performs the twist as Dalgu tries to impress the dormitory inspector with his moves, with her expressing interest in him a little later. Deoksu and Youngja are cheered on the dance, despite the former not knowing the moves. This party is one of the happiest moments Deoksu would experience in Germany. Well into the night, he and Dalgu visit Youngja in her dorm room after the party. While Dalgu gets lucky in the female inspector's bedroom, Deoksu shares a meal with her as she craves Korean food. She confides in him about her initial struggles as a nurse in Germany, including her daily duties with patients and her lonely moments studying alone. At the same time, her nose bleeds due to being overworked. She has never been happier to connect with another migrant worker from Korea like Deoksu. The pair starts dating as they go out for a picnic, ride a boat at sunset, and stop for ice cream. The day ends with Deoksu thrilled to hold her hand so tight. Soon after, Deoksu and Dalgu barely make it alive from a mining explosion, where the tunnel collapses on them. The injured are brought to St. Anna's as Youngja looks around for Deoksu at the refinery, begging the commissioner to rescue everyone else trapped inside. 
Her incessant pleading does not go well, leading all the workers to take matters into their own hands by saving the men in the mine. Meanwhile, although the two friends can hardly breathe with all the soot, they waited out for hours, feeling hopeful while remembering good times, and eventually, they are rescued. At the hospital, Diaksu tells Youngja to come back with him to Korea after his visa expires. Unfortunately, her responsibilities as a nurse prevent her from leaving right away, so she tearfully wishes him the best on his return. Sometime later, he reunites with his family and works in his aunt's shop. An entrepreneur, Kim Bong Nam, passes by and becomes enthused with the embroidery and the fabric they are selling. Just as he leaves for his fabric business, Diaksu sees Youngja return from Germany. Thrilled, he takes her by the seaside cliffs to catch up, only to hear she's pregnant with his child, revealing they had done it after the party. After that, they have a modest wedding, begin a life together, and eventually have two sons. In the present, Youngja spends her day out of bed listening to music at the Finger Munders stall while Diaksu complains about the singer. In the autumn of 1973, after his aunt passes, Duksu is accepted by the Korean Mari Tim University while his sister airs grievances with her mother, wishing for a big wedding as she is engaged. Meanwhile, his now elderly uncle requires money and decides to sell the imported goods store, a move Diaksu disagrees with. Later, he announces to the family he will be drafted to take part in the Vietnam War. It is also his way to pay for his sister's wedding by earning enough money to purchase the imported goods store from his uncle, much to his wife's protest. They argue at the park, as Young Ja believes he lives for others, not himself. They later stop to sing the national anthem. In the summertime of 1974, Saigon, Vietnam, Diak Su, and Dal Gu worked for the American military. While on a delivery run, he gives a crying child a Hershey's bar, remembering the days he was bullied. Just as he feels good about himself, a bomb explodes in the Vietnamese facility, leaving many casualties, including the young boy who tried to warn him. Despite this, he writes to Young Ja about living comfortably in Vietnam, not knowing it has been difficult. She reads his letter filled with tears as she hugs their son. A year later, he and Dal Gu hide out in the jungle from the Viet Cong and are miraculously saved by a well-known Korean soldier, Nam Jean, whom Dal Gu gets an autograph after being rescued from snakes. As the militant group leaves, the villagers beg them to stay and protect them from the Viet Cong Diak Su then finds another way to save them by bringing them on the boat while leaving all their cargo behind. Just then, the Viet Cong attack, leaving some people shot while Diak Su falls from the boat but is again saved by Nam Jean. They eventually rescue the villagers as they blow up the pier. He returns to Korea with a lame leg and continues to run the store with his wife. With him back home, he can finally take his sister down the aisle giving her the wedding she deserves. Later in 1983, major broadcast stations in South Korea ran TV programs from the Korean Broadcasting Network in which relatives separated during the Korean War were reunited. Diaksu is contacted to be featured in one of these shows after finding out an elderly man from his hometown claims to be his father. On TV, the two realize they are not father and son, much to his family's disappointment over the mistake. But soon afterward, the same program brings Diaksu back to the TV program, hoping to find his long-lost sister, Maxun. The show features a Korean-American woman adopted as a child by a U.S. family during the Korean War. Diaksu converses with her and realizes she is indeed his sister. An emotional reunion ensues as Maxun comes to Korea with her family. After this, their mother passes away, unable to fulfill her dream of reuniting with her husband. Back in the present, Diaksu's family has a celebration at his place. His grandchildren show off their talents as Seo Yun sings the North Korean anthem about the Hongnam evacuation, surprising everyone. Later, he cries in his loneliness, realizing his father had promised to reunite with the family at the store, thus explaining why he held on to the store for so long. The movie ends with Diaksu telling Youngja that he will sell his aunt's imported goods store, finally able to let go of the past. Then, seeing a butterfly, he wistfully tells her that his father is probably too old to remain alive and reunite with him. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.